Professor David Wilson joins us now to discuss the case a little bit further. Morning, David. Good morning. Thank you for morning, joining us. Um, it's really interesting, the fact that we're still talking about this 60 years on, and we're still quite interested in this story, aren't we? Well, and I think rightly so. I mean, serial killers are very rare in Britain, and Brady and Hindley are serial killers. But I think what really generates such uh, an interest in this case is just the depravity of what happened to those, those victims. And we know about that depravity because his, the penultimate victim was Leslie Ann Downey and then Edward Evans. Brady and Hindley recorded Leslie Ann Downey uh, as she was being killed and that tape was available. So it, it took you into the moment when Leslie would lose her life, Leslie Ann would lose her life. And then of course with Edward Evans, there's a witness to the murder itself, Myra Hindley's brother-in-law, David Smith, and Smith is a whistleblower effectively and describes to the police how Edward lost his life. And it was because of that, I think, initially, just because the, the crimes themselves were so sadistic, so gruesome, and one heard a victim pleading for her life that made the case really stand out. And it's a living memory for so many people, I think, isn't it? Oh, case, absolutely. Isn't it? I mean, this was one of the defining moments of the 60s. Yeah. Can I just ask, do you think that was their, their downfall in introducing the, the brother-in-law into the situation? Because, obviously, they'd got on away with it before. It was David Smith. You know, David Smith brings all of uh, Moore's murders to an end because he blows the whistle. And he's brought into the murders because Ian Brady thought of himself as this cool, sophisticated... He wanted to be a bank robber. He was anti-authoritarian. And seemingly, he was trying to groom David Smith to join him on their bank robberies. Um, and, of course, uh, Ian Brady was never a bank robber. He murdered children. But it was David Smith blowing the whistle that brings everything to an end. So what, did he witness the murder and then... And then sort of, did he make his excuses or something and then rang the police, or...? It, what happened was that he was there as Edward Evans was being murdered by Brady, being hit over the head, um, brutally, time after time. And then he... Because he feared for his own life, he had to help with cleaning the oh front goodness. room up. Oh, and gosh. then he made his excuses, got away, went to a public phone box and reported what had happened. And that really is the beginning of the end. And it was really controversial at the time, because I can remember they got rid of hanging a year before, then they went to trial. So the, they were in quite a lot of danger, weren't they, when they went to trial? Oh, they, were, they, were, they had death threats. The police were all... It was Chester uh, Crown Court, April 1966. Uh, they, Brady and Hidley had to give their evidence behind bulletproof glass. Um, hanging had been abolished in 1965. The last people who had actually been hanged had been in 1964. And so the public were going, look at how appalling these crimes are, yeah. and we've just abolished hanging. So, of course, that adds to that layer of why we're still interested in the case, because it's about the swinging 60s. Mm. It's about, you know, is our culture changing irrevocably? How, how should we react to those changes? The tape fascinates me. I mean, what, is that just pure narcissism, do you think? I think it's pure psychopathy. Narcissism is part of the psychopathic personality disorder. And Brady, of course, it, it, without any doubt, you know, psychopathy is a much overused label, but without doubt, Ian Brady was a psychopath. He showed no empathy. He couldn't walk in another person's shoes. He wanted to record uh, Leslie Ann Downey being murdered because he, in some way, had been reading Sartre. He didn't believe in God. He, he read the Marquis de Sade. Oh. He wanted to act out what he saw was a way of saying civilization is bankrupt. Do you think Hinley would have been a murderer if she hadn't met him? I think that's one of the key questions that this case still raises. Because, for me, what we've got here is a classic folie à deux, literally a madness shared by two. And within any folie à deux, one always has a dominant and a subservient. The subservient adopts the dominant's wow. entire worldview. And I think it is a moot point. Would Myra Hindley ever have killed anybody if she had not met and fallen under the spell of Ian Brady? Mm. So, so interesting. So, th th because there was a, well, a couple of decades before they confessed to, to, to other murders, is that correct? 
Yeah. So initially in 1966, uh, they're going to be convicted of three murders. And then Myra Hindley, once the folie à deux begins to break down, she's sent obviously to a women's prison. She begins to go through a process of change. You can decide whether or not those changes were authentic and genuine or not. But she goes through a process of change and she is therefore going to start telling people about other crimes that Brady and Hindley committed. So as a way of taking the initiative back from her, Brady then says, OK, we did kill Pauline Reed and Keith Bennett. And therefore, that leads to the, the discovery of Pauline Reed's body. Of course, one of the other unsolved qu uh, questions is where was Keith Bennett's body hidden on Saddleworth Moor? Mm -hmm. Why didn't he just admit it and just tell them the truth? I don't understand why, you know, he's not coming out of prison. Why didn't he just tell th yeah. them where the body was? You know, that's such a good question because I think people imagine that killers, especially when they're close to death, want to unburden themselves, yeah. want to say, you know, look, here are all the murders I committed, blah, 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 I'm going to meet my maker. Well, firstly, Brady was, did not believe in God, um, so he didn't care that he might be going to meet his maker. But the reason why they don't tell Ali is because it's a way that they can keep power. It's a way that they can uh -huh. keep control. They can still insert themselves into the narrative of the case and manipulate their own public persona, uh -huh. their own public standing, by saying, oh, I've got a bit more information. I might tell you where Keith Bennett's body is buried in my will, which, of course, he never did. Uh, there might be more documents that shows where Keith Bennett's we've only there. we've only got a minute left over here, but it's just the, the the luggage of Brady's. Um, could this provide any answers? What, what do you know about this? Well, the, there is. Uh, he did have two locked suitcases, which he gave to his lawyer um, just before he died. For me, one would hope that that might help get some peace for the Bennett family. But my own sense of working with serial killers over many, many years is that, you know, frankly, you never believe them. I don't think it will help. If Ian Brady was to tell me the sun was shining today, I'd carry an umbrella and I'd put on a raincoat. Yeah. Oh, do you know what? Our hearts are just with the victims, as far as the I'm concerned. Families, absolutely. And I hate the fact that he was a game player. He liked to play games with the police. Absolutely awful. Yeah. But yeah, my, my definitely, I, I think about the families absolutely. all the time. And it's extraordinary that, you know, we don't got time to get into this, but it's extraordinary that the police can't get to this luggage. No, they, they, they've had to appeal, and now they, they've won their appeal, so they should be able to go to the luggage and see what's contained within the luggage. Hopefully it will tell us something that might be useful. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. That's fascinating. Mm. Thank you so much.